And I heard him say, nothing's ever promised tomorrow today. And I heard him say, nothing's ever promised tomorrow today. But we'll find a way. Once you hit rock bottom, the only way to go is up. So, so good luck. Okay, good luck. You say rock bottom, but like, it just seems like things keep getting worse. What, what is rock bottom? Who decides what's the bottom of all this? I mean, seriously, you go, okay, today is Friday, and I woke up in Cleveland, and I'm going, how much worse can it get? Don't pound me down, you piece of shit! Shut your mouth! Look at me, Tony. Look at me. I want you to fire me. You fucking mark. Fire me. Fire me. How you think they gonna feel when they introduce your boys as the new WWE Undisputed Tag Team Champion? I don't know who's. They might be cheering. Yeah. They might be booing. Yeah. Little kids might be crying. Oh, yeah. We got grown men out there crying. Yeah. But they still might be hating on the Uso. Hating on us? Why? Because we went out there and did what we said we was going to do. Yeah. Buffalo, all your babbling is interfering with my machine. So, for the next few minutes, please just do me a favor and kindly... Shoot! Hello, ladies and germs. Welcome to episode 322 of the Hoots Podcast. Hope you're enjoying your week so far. It's August 11, 2022. As I'm recording this live in my good brother's studio in lovely Chicago, Illinois. Um, lots to discuss this week. If you all could do us a quick favor, please, if you're watching or listening to the Hoots Podcast, first of all, we'd like to say thank you for giving us a chance. Uh, secondly, if you could... Please subscribe to our channel and press the uh, notification bell so you get notified every time a new episode of the Hoops Podcast drops on YouTube especially. But also you can get the podcast free of charge anywhere you get your podcast from. Spotify. What? Stitcher. What? Apple Podcasts. Why? Google Podcasts. Why? Um, iHeartRadio. Why? Um, <laughs> Google Podcasts, why? Overcast, why? Breaker, why? <laughs> plenty of, plenty of places to get the Who's Podcast. Uh, this is your first time listening to the show. This show um, is intended for those who want to, to chill and have a good casual conversation about the world of professional wrestling while also giving some good life advice along the way. I am Josh Lopez. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh Lopez Media and on Instagram at the same handle. Um, Brother Carter this week, who's my usual co-host of the show, is uh, via satellite this week. I think Brother Carter's going back to his via satellite routine for the coming weeks because he's going back to his work schedule, which is cool. Uh, always appreciative when we do have Brother Carter's uh, presence on the podcast, whether it's on video, the video boss, or um, when uh, he comes and sends his clips via um, satellite, which means you're getting a brand new edition of the Thoughts of Derrico at the end of the podcast this week. So stay tuned for that to follow our main event of the show. Lots to discuss. And uh, as you see in the title of this episode, um, 
there's a lot to discuss on what we saw at CBS last night. Um, <laughs> just when you think the bar goes lower and lower for myself, Burr Carver, because the AW, they seem to um, reach a new, a new low. Uh, so we'll get to that. Talk about what's going on with WWE and all these changes that are going around. And um seems like uh, what I've realized is that, again, even with all the stuff with Triple H taking charge of creative or whatever, it seems like the only thing people care about in wrestling today or want to talk about is booking. Uh, it just amazes me. I've, I've been doing podcasting, wrestling talk shows, if you will, for the better part of nine years, and I never cared about booking one time out of this whole scenario because, one, I'm not a booker, and two, it's not prevalent to what we're talking about the actual show. Like, I not if you see me doing a recap of a movie series or how I met your mother or this and that, yeah, is there things you like to question here and there? Sure, but the whole spectrum of the conversation is booking this and booking that and. I don't know. The, the time when you guys see me getting in knots about booking or wins and loss records, please just remind me to stop doing this, okay? Because honestly, it's it's not worth it. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the little uh, positive message I shared before the intro could be heard the podcast this week, which was um, heard and said by Kanye West and Adam Levine from Room 5. And I wanted to do that. I may do it every other week or so. I like to bring different wrinkles to the pocket so you're not hearing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and I like to... What we like to do here on the Hoots Podcast is give affirmation and, um, you know, give some hope to some people who maybe feel like down throughout the week or uh, just not in a good mental place. Uh, and hopefully this podcast can be a positive escape for you. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and what the hell is wrong with AEW, too, because I, I, the question I ask for myself is, like, why? Why do we do the segment? And I think there's some misconceptions behind it, and i like to expand on that a little later on when we get to it. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I want you guys to enjoy this experience, and I want you guys to take something positive and take some life lessons along the way. If I could do that... For you, then, our goal is accomplished here. The show's been gaining um, a lot of good momentum over the last couple weeks. Uh, I mean, we've um, had, I think, uh, 35-plus thousand increase in listeners and downloads over the last couple weeks. It's been really cool. Uh, I talked about last week's being the highest-rated episode uh, this past week. was pretty good as well, and we're over 530,000 uh, listeners and downloads on Acre, which is pretty cool. And again, stay you, like, there's so many different wrestling pockets out there that offer a lot of different things, and there's a lot of good wrestling pockets out there, but there's also a lot of wrestling pockets out there that rattle off the same shit every single week and just keep the toxic energy going the entire show. Uh, we're not refraining from giving our opinions, and I... I I say this with a smile on my face that I'm glad that this podcast in a lot of ways has had no filter since we started this six years ago with Adam Daly because um, my intention of this podcast was never to make it feel like a sports center show or uh, something that's offering to potential employers or anything like that. This is a passion project of mine. Uh, this is something that I wanted to do uh, for me. Uh, and I wanted to bring something different to the table in this field, and I am very cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of wrestling podcasts out there, and a lot of them have a lot of clout and fame and stuff like that, and I'm happy for those people's success, but there's also a lot of people that have that same success, but bring no substance or nuance to the field in the conversations they engage themselves with with their audience, audiences, and I, I feel like a lot of people in this field lead the wrestling fans astray. And, again, I'm not somebody who's in the wrestling industry. I cover the wrestling industry for a living, but I'm not a reporter. I don't do rumors. I don't do that backstage politic BS stuff. I really don't care. But, again, going back to the non-filter stuff, it's not just so I can come on here and curse and blah, 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 but 
I think those who are watching or listening this would appreciate just having a nuanced conversation as if I'm sitting next to you in your front living room or in the back porch uh, late at night on the weekend, just chilling, uh, chilling and shooting the shit with each other, right? And that's been the goal of the show since day one. Ever since me and Adam started doing the show, I we wanted to make you feel like you were watching me at his house you know, doing our thing and just, you know, talking. And I I hope we've kept that vibe. And I know that What the Hell is Wrong AEW has become a popular bit on the show. But I don't want to come on here and act like I'm playing a character because I'm not. Uh, I don't have a gimmick. Um, I don't like, I don't believe in gimmicks when it comes to content creation. Um this is a place you're getting everything that I feel in the world of professional wrestling, whether you agree or disagree with what I see in the world of professional wrestling, that's cool. But one thing's for certain, every time you listen to an episode of the Hoots podcast, you're getting 100% authentic Joshi Lopez. And this is a great platform for myself in a lot of ways, because uh, not from a career or financial point of view, but for an emotional and mental point of view, I, this is why I do this particular podcast. Now, with the transcripts that I do and stuff with ProWrestlingTranscripts.com and the stuff I share on Wrestling Headlines, that's work. That's professional stuff. That's the stuff that I care about money-wise and blah, 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 and acclaim and all that shit. But when it comes to this show, this show is uh, about having a platform to release any bad energy that I have within myself, but in a positive light. Like, I don't want to come in here and be a negative guy. I, I'm, I'm not a negative guy, but <laughs> uh, to a fault, I am a straight shooter, and I don't hold anything back. I don't. And I feel, in a lot of ways, that I feel better myself uh, mentally when I have weight taken off my shoulders and I can come on here and just talk. Uh, I really don't have platforms or uh, venues to really uh, express myself that much because a lot of my main friends live out of state. I, you don't see me going out to clubs and stuff on the weekends. Um, I'm a very busy guy. So when I, I get an opportunity to come on here and just talk and be myself, it's, uh, it's a weekly challenge that I look forward to. Uh, and this is real life. This is, if you if you want to go through like a real life uh, therapy session with me, that's what this podcast is. Just without the gory, not gory, but wrong way to describe. But without the real life issues to like the deepest extent of details, you know, like I'm not going to reveal every little thing that's going on in my life, but. I'm not afraid to have some difficult conversations with you guys. And I've talked about a lot of different things and the stuff that I went through. Not out of sympathy, but just having real conversations. And I, one thing I want people to know as you listen to this is that, you know, whether you deal with depression or you deal with heartbreak, uh, whether you're a product of being a kid with divorced parents, whatever the situation is, I want you to understand that you're not alone. Okay? And that um, it's okay to not be okay. All right. Uh, it, it's okay to express yourself. It's okay to show emotion. Hell, it's okay to even cry here and there. And I want you guys to continue to remind yourself every day that your happiness should not be dictated by the people that are reaching out to you or not reaching out to you on a daily basis. Um, it's not to look at it from a selfish point of view, but how how can you validate yourself based on what other people think about you if you don't validate how you see yourself when you wake up every day? You know what I mean? Like, there's no validation that's worth more in this life than the validation that you see within yourself and the man upstairs. You know, opinions for family members are just that, opinions. It's not the gospel. Friends are flaky. Friends will turn their back on you. Friends will um, lead you astray. Friends will do a lot of different things. But as long as you have yourself, that's what's important at the end of the day. 
because that's the only person that's going to push you to do the things that you want. You are responsible for your story. Nobody else. Uh, we have people that we um, run into in this life period that teaches a lot of great life lessons. But everything within action has to come through you. What's inside of you should be dictated by you and nobody else. So, all that being said, <laughs> let's have some fun, shall we? Let's get into the back porch Q&A session. All right. As we continue to expand this um, this segment, I've been very appreciative of the guys who've been consistent and sending questions to the pockets each and every single week. Um, I would like to expand the different topics that we approach here on this segment because, you know, we could do full breakdowns of Raw or SmackDown like every other wrestling podcast, but I want to expand this thing. I don't want it to be just wrestling. Ask me about sports. Ask me about life. Ask me about anything. Mental health, relations. I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, I, 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 honestly, for, Mike, Chris, everybody else that sends questions here, everybody that's listening to this right now, like, if you want to be part of this segment, even the stuff you want to know about me, <laughs> I'm not I'm not really open on social media personally, unless there's something I really need to say that I feel is prevalent and it may can help people along the way. But as far as, like, within myself, this is the only platform that I can really open up. If, if people really want to know the real me and want to know behind the scenes of the show and stuff like that or how to get into podcasting and something. I want I want this segment to be more than just wrestling. Ask me anything. I I, I see I, I I'd say that from my heart. Ask me anything but wrestling. Like I want this QA to be a chance for you guys to get to know me. And let's do that. So I I am I want to say that while saying that I am very appreciative of the guys that do send questions because they send good ones every single week. But let's try to expand the back porch Q and A for what it is. Let's treat this segment for what it should be. We're around a fire pit. Just visualize it for yourself, right? We're around a fire pit. Maybe I'm playing a couple of uh, songs on acoustic guitar. We're chilling. Some people may be drinking beers. What? Maybe it's a uh, uh, a, Mil- a Miller Lite, what? Bud Light, <laughs> a seltzer. <laughs> uh, uh, who the fuck wants a seltzer? No, 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 no. <laughs> but honestly, like, let's expand what's what this Q and A segment could be. I think this could be a fun segment to do, and it's something I do look forward to because I'm very appreciative for those who really um, enjoy this podcast for what it is. So. We're going to get to our questions, and we're going to do it right and now. All right. I'm going to start off this week with the good brother, um, Nate the Great, at Psycho Nagiri. Nate, welcome back to the show, my brother. Thanks for sending some questions this week. Uh, he says, are you happy CM Punk is back? Seems like he's still hobbling. Uh, yes, CM Punk made his return last night on Dynamite at Quake by the Lake. Uh, <laughs> mistake by the Lake, let's call this correctly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, of course, I'm always gonna be happy when I see CM Punk on my TV screen. Uh, that is my favorite wrestler, so of course, I'm happy to see it back, but I don't know. I, I'll expand more into this and what the hell is wrong with AEW, but it, it just felt off. To me, like, I don't take reactions to live AEW crowds with, uh, I take live reactions from AEW crowds with a grain of salt. You know what I mean? Like, if I could make that more clear, like, I don't think their reactions is something to uh, correlate through my vortex that something is over. Just something about it just felt off. The whole thing about the interim title, all of it is just odd. I personally have no interest in seeing John Moxley against CM Punk. I've seen it in WWE. Um, John Moxley, if you've seen one John Moxley match, you've seen all of them. And <laughs> I see it'd be a better pop 
if MJF came out and laid out everybody. But that's just my opinion. Um, and again, if Punk is not healthy enough to get to where he needs to be right now, where he needs to, you know, wrap up his shit and get ready to rock and roll, why rush him? Just because it's Chicago, I get it, but okay. <laughs> You probably get a couple good promos, okay, but is CM Punk versus John Moxley something I need to see right now? Is that something that I need to shell out fifty bucks for a pay per view or a hundred eighty bucks for tickets for a three day combo pack for um, AEW? No, um, so. I they to answer your question. I'm happy that he's back. I'm always, I'm always happy to see CM Punk, but under these circumstances, that's gonna be a, a no. Um, that's a good question, though. All right, really, I know, but do you think Ricky Starks will be a better face or a heel? Um, I think he has potential to do both, but I think in a natural state of mind, I think Ricky Starks is just a, a better, well off heel. Um, but you know, I, I see a lot of people that talk about him and rock comparisons, and yeah, I get he wears some fancy rock style shirts from the late nineties, but um, he has charisma. I will not take that away from him, and he does good stuff in the ring. And I've been a fan of Ricky Starks. There's not a lot of people in AEW I'm fans of, but Ricky Starks is one of them, and I enjoy his work. Um, but. I think, to answer this question, I feel that he's better off as a heel than a babyface. But, honestly, for him, he could probably pull off that gray area character if he wanted to. So, um, I just think if you, if, I, if I had to choose one heel or babyface, I think Ricky Starks would be uh, better off as a heel. A heel, baby. All right. <laughs> Next question. If what you see for Tony D, do you think he's championship material? Oh, of course. <laughs> you gotta represent the, the Gabagool, the Gabagool. Yes. I'm a big fan of uh, Tony D'Angelo. Um, could he be an NXT champion? Sure, why not? Um, one thing I think is missed in the world of professional wrestling, we've had factions, we've had the NWOs, you had the Evolution type of factions. We've seen a lot of factions, but as a kid who grew up, you know, watching Sopranos, um, I said it before, I was a big fan of the Black Mass movie, which is about Whitey Bulger and, you know, mob. I'm really into those mob movies and stuff like that. Um, the part of the course is not a good one. Of course, you can't forget about the Goodfellas and Scarface and all the other great movies, but um, one thing in wrestling that you know, maybe it could come off stereotypical, but that hasn't been done right, in my opinion, is the actual faction that really holds, has a stranglehold on the entire company. And it's hard to do it because a lot of the wrestling shows are always shot in the arena, right? And you don't have a wrestling company that's really based like around different shooting areas. Like one thing that I really enjoyed about Lucha Underground was the fact that they shot outside the arena. And yes, the tape show is a different type of wrestling show, but you know, the closest we got to like something that's really effective from a mob point of view and, and it worked in how it affected the landscape of the wrestling promotion was uh, uh, Dario Cueto with uh, Lucha Underground. Uh, And I really enjoyed that. And I think something if you if you can have a scenario in wrestling where you have a mob faction where you don't have to do the gimmicky stereotype names for mobs mobsters or gangsters, but if, let's say you have a commentator, right? That's like a normal guy like Tom Phillips, right? Or Marinal or Kevin Kelly. You know, you know him, you trust him. All that is a straight baby face commentator, right? And then you look at it, um, and you could um, see as time goes by, and maybe there's a missing um, 
on air authority figure. Now, who's the messenger of the show? The play by play guy, right? Oh, unless it's Monday Night Raw where Corey Graves has to overstep uh, Jimmy Smith every five seconds. But you get my point. Think about this. You have the straight face commentator, but behind the scenes, he's actually pulling the strings. This is the only thing I only way I think it could work because you have a guy that's narrating your product, right? He knows everything in within the show because he has to. He has to narrate the audience that's watching the show, right? As a commentator, he's doing his baby face thing. You know, things develop, things, different angles start coming up with attacks and stuff like that. And you get more details. He, you know, the straight face commentator is pulling the strings, though, behind the scenes, right? And he, he's and he's on camera, and he's you know asking who's doing who's doing this, why would they do this, blah 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 blah. He has the answers because that's the person. He's the Don. He's the Tony Soprano. He's the Whitey Bulger. He's the whoever you want to say uh, of the mob faction. Well, sorry, short ends up being the ringleader of a group. You have a certain group of people, maybe four people at most. I wouldn't want to have a mob faction be like five or seven people. It'd be, be kind of stupid. But but think about that. You have somebody who first was a commentator, gained trust in the audience, uh, narrated the shows, right? Somehow there's a missing authority figure. Infiltrate the company. You hold all the keys. You still have the power to send the message that you want through your broadcast. Things could change. Maybe the commentator, now that he's revealed his dot, could be the Oscar authority figure and the main antagonist on the show. And then you can have babe faces going after him and stuff like that. And then you have some really cool payoff like that at a WrestleMania. Just an idea. Just an idea. Like, I like Tony D'Angelo. I think he has a lot. I know the question was about Tony D'Angelo. But honestly, when I hear about the Moss stuff and the Tony D'Angelo group, like it gets my creative juices flowing. Because this is something that I would like to do if I ever got into wrestling, right? If I was in WWE and I ever had an opportunity to be an on-screen authority figure, I would like to be like the Tony Soprano of WWE. And, you know, you don't have to do the outside things where we're shooting people and all this extra stereotypical shit. But, like, you have somebody that's like a Don that's just, like, infiltrated the WWE has all the power kind of similar to like what Joseph Samuel Samuel did in MLW you know with Contra something like that I think it'd be pretty cool it's just my idea my idea I'd love to hear your guys thoughts on it but that's a good question Nate uh next one that Nate sent here was what do you think Dexter will bring to Raw uh different character uh that was my takeaway more than anything that I saw him on Raw, I know a lot of people are like, well, oh, here's Triple H just bringing in his NXT, guys. Well, aren't you the same audience that says that you're sick and tired of seeing the same people on the show every week? And sick and tired of seeing the same matches? As I said a couple weeks ago when this move happened, um, you know, stop trying to put yourself in knots over this thing and let's see how things develop. You can't, you can't curtail or pinpoint what change is in two weeks. I don't think anybody with a rational point of view can look at what's going on with WWE and say, okay, that that's different. That's different. Doing this week by week, show by show analysis of, oh, this is Triple H versus Vince McMahon's booking. Look, I get it. There's a lot of stuff about Vince McMahon booking that a lot of you don't like. And cool, that's your opinion. But let's not sit here and act like even within the last 10 years that the guy did not have good ideas or concepts, okay? You know, <laughs> let, 
I get it. He's done a lot of bad shit, and there's a lot of people that don't like him, and he was the reason why a lot of people hate watch WWE. I get the whole gamut. I really do. But, again, for a lot of people that made it out like WWE is an unwatchable show and they're the worst wrestling company in the world, you're only doing that because your favorites were not winning titles and that you weren't get mark booking and shit that you see from AW. Let's call it what it is, okay? And when I watch the shows now with Triple H, I'm not, I'm not watching the show thinking, oh my god, this is so much better than Vince. This is so much better than Vince. Again, my intention when I'm watching or covering a wrestling show is not what the fuck is going on behind the scenes or booking. I don't care who the booker is. Just put on a good show. I don't care. I really don't care. Dexter Lewis can bring a lot of different things. He's a different character. He's a different wrestler. He can mesh well with different performers on the roster. It's a different performer on the show. That's what everybody wants, right? We want to see new, fresh faces, right? So, man, I want to thank you for your questions this week. I appreciate it, my man. Um, all right, next set of questions comes from Mike Rubio at Main Event Swerve. Uh, make sure you follow him there. He's a good brother of all good brothers. He said, uh, what – I, here's the question. He said, here's the question to QA this week. Some of them are serious and some of them are fun. All right. I think that social media is an amazing thing. There's a lot of good with it. But do you find that there are an increasing amount of keyboard warriors who hit with a message that block or delete? Oh, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, Twitter is the hub of on the surface takes and just putting out shit with no context or nuance to it. Of course there is. It doesn't have to be just wrestling related. It's just life related. Um, I, I just, it just amazes me that Twitter acts like they have to be the authority on every topic of life and that they're the morale p- police when the same people who like to talk about morality and being good people are just as hypocritical and two-faced as the people they're calling them out. You know, You know who they are. I don't have to say names. But again, it's like, what do you get out of it? Just be a fucking human being and talk. Just say what you're talking to your mind. Stop putting out tweets out there just to get likes and retweets. Stop being a clout chaser. It's not that hard. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, how do you guys navigate an increasingly divisive world to keep conversation civil instead of they calling it parented talking points? Well, again, it's just and this is an issue that's plaguing the country as a whole is just self-awareness and self, uh, just general empathy. Look, I don't expect people to watch or listen to the show and agree with 100% of everything that comes out of my mouth. I get it. Uh, I may be enemy number one in the wrestling podcasting vortex because I don't kiss Tony Khan's ass and stuff like that, and I'm not an AEW fan, and I will call out their shit because they call themselves all elite wrestling, but there's no elite standards attached to their product. You know, nobody questions what they do. So I get it. <laughs> but again, I'm not coming in here and calling people Nimrods. I would call Dave Meltzer and Bri- Brianna Alvarez a Nimrod because they are Nimrods. But again, when it comes to the overall wrestling audience, my only issue is, is that a lot of people don't take the time to just think for themselves. This shit's subjective in the day. Stop letting what Bully Ray or Lance Storm or all, any of these wrestling personalities curtail your opinion, you know? Think for yourself. It's not that hard. If you don't like something, cool. But again, it's just like that wasted energy where we have to dish out taste that somebody else says just so we can get clout and followers and retweets and stuff like that. And I, I just never been with that vibe or that energy. I, I, I'm not a clout chaser. I'm not. Uh, as far as um, keeping things simple and stuff, hell, I'm, I'm sure there's times where me and Brother Carter disagree on things, but uh, I have a rapport with Brother Carter. We have chemistry on the air as you guys listen to the show each week and you guys can tell that. And he's a brother and a friend of mine, and I, you know, we're here to have fun. That's the point of this podcast. We're here to, you know, we'll have some real conversations, 
I may we may get to topics that may be uncomfortable. I may say some things that are uncomfortable, but the truth is uncomfortable too. There's a quote that Mike Tomlin says that I and it's a way of life that I subscribe to in a lot of ways is being be comfortable being uncomfortable. Because there's going to be a lot of times in life where you're going to be put in, in situations where you may be uncomfortable or you least expect it. And what are you going to do to adapt to it? And when it comes to uh, different topics or, you know, how people view racism or sexism or whatever topic it is, I can only speak for myself. I'm not going to tell somebody how to think, how to feel. I can speak for myself. And if there's something that we agree or disagree on, I just keep it moving because I'm not part of wasted energy. Now, if somebody's going to be condescending and just wasting my time with bullshit that's stuff that I don't want to see on Twitter, I'm, I'm not afraid to use the mute option. Trust me. The only good thing about Twitter is the fact there is a mute option because there is so much bullshit and litter out there on Twitter that it's just hard to sit through. And it's like, you were reminded every day, like, why are you a wrestling fan? All the stuff that I see on Twitter every day about booking this and booking that, it's like, you need to remind yourself why you're a wrestling fan in the first place. It's not like the, you're want to be, you, you get what I'm saying. I don't need, I'm not going to repeat myself to death today. Um, all right, next question. One more serious one. I have a bunch of friends in other countries that are like, what the hell happened to the U.S.? So how would you explain what happened on January 6, 2021 uh, with the U.S. Capitol? Um, uh, pretty simple, um, especially in this past regime of the president with Donald Trump. Uh, a lot of people in the way of life act like robots and act accordingly to whatever... Um, political stance they grew up on. And again, a lot of people in society act like robots. This is the way of life. You, you're a Democrat. You got to support this. You're a Republican. You got to support that. I'm independent. I'm independent to the fault. I think for myself, both rep Republicans and Democrats are full of their own shit. To be honest with you. As far as what happened on January 6, 2021, this is uh, was going on when uh, Joe Biden got elected as president and Trump went on his cry, crying bitch uh, campaign about fake votes and uh, false envelopes and, you know, the whole deal. And his tribalism, Proud Boy Network, uh, MAGA, the MAGA universe decided to uh, they felt compelled to storm the Capitol and put American people's lives on the line over the fact that a scumbag that was didn't really care about U.S. best interests at the end of the day, so they decided to, hey, we're going to storm the Capitol and cause a riot because our guy didn't get reelected. Basically, that's what happened. All right, what teams would your NFL fantasy football defense be if the season started today? Good question. Um, I would go with Pittsburgh. Uh, as we're talking about defense here, I'll go with Pittsburgh. Uh, go with the Chargers. I think the Chargers are going to be really good this year, and their defense is uh, filled with superstars. So I, I would go with the Chargers there. Um, let's see. Any other defenses that really stand out the top of hand? I, 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 I say Buffalo still has a good defense. I'm curious to see how Bob Miller helps things out there. That should be interesting. But if I had to pick one particular football defense for fantasy football this year, it would be Pittsburgh. I think they're going to be balling out this year. <laughs> um, Question number five here from uh, Mikey says, who would you predict to be the XC? Hold it. Who would you predict to be the next WWE programming crossover breakout performance? So think of Raw, Talent having SmackDown storylines, XC goes Raw, like with Nikita, it's uh, so, so you're saying like, what's the next crossover thing? Um, 
depending on how things play out with the Clash of the Castle, uh, it would be pretty cool to have somebody from Raw or SmackDown fight somebody from XC UK. Like, let's have... Well, I can't, you can't do the Judgment Day now because it looks like Edge is going to fight Finn Balor, you know, but um, let's see. I mean, hell, do do the Usos, do the Usos against Gallus for the SmackDown Tag Team titles at, um, at Clash of the Castle, you know, something like that. Um, so, like, like I mentioned last week, you could do Miko Santamora versus Asuka for the NXT UK Women's Championship. NXT UK should be part of this pay-per-view. It's in Cardiff. They haven't had a takeover since the pandemic started. Showcase that brand. They have a lot of good performers there. Bring Nigel McGinnis. Bring Andy Shepard. There should be an NXT UK presence on this pay-per-view. That's what I would do. Um, one to six. It seems like NXT's Malik Blade and Idris Nofe have been repackaged with Last Legend. Who else would like to see repackaged in NXT? Now, I watched NXT this week. I think you got a little mixed up, Mike. Uh, they're not being in a group with Last Legend. Last Legend was, again, being all about herself backstage, and they just happened to be there. Uh, I think Last Legend is more realigned with Pretty Deadly than she's aligned with Blade and the No Face. So, a little mix up there, but I get what you're saying there. Uh, who else would you like to see repackaged at NXT? Um, good question. I don't know about you guys, but. I can see some good baby face run in Gigi Dolan if she ever makes that turn. Don't get me wrong. I love seeing her, and trust me, I do. <laughs> her waterfall game knows no bounds. Uh, same thing with JC Jane. But uh, as far as, like, character work, I, I think Gigi Dolan could be a good baby face if she wants to do it. But uh, she's good in her role in NXT, and I like what I see there so far. Um, good question here. He says, who can you remember in the past year for WWE rec- recruiting classes breaking out in NXT? Well, to answer that question, I look at it more from the shows that I cover from NXT level up that I see on the main NXT 2.0 show. Like, the only other exception I could bring up here is Damon Kemp, maybe, but... There's other ones. There's like Soul Roca, uh, a female who's uh, been on Level Up a couple times that I've been impressed by. Um, Hank Walker is another one. There's an amateur wrestler named Miles Bourne who's been doing some good matches on Level Up as well. Uh, again, the, the expectation is not to have these NLI, NIL talents to come in here and just automatically be like a any darling guy that could do spot fests all the time. But there are potential performers out there that I think that could do a lot of good stuff. Uh, you know, I, I'd be on the lookout for Sol Roca. I think she has potential for how she carries herself in the ring. And um, I like I liked what I've seen so far. Hell, you could even attach to the you can attach the crew brush to this too, because if anything, they are the first like NIL based talent for this recruiting class for the PC that um, have had some success in WWE and I'm look at them they're the current NC uh, tag team champions um, so if they could like cool down a little bit more the 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 reliance on the grappling stuff there in their matches I think that'd be good. Like, don't cry. I get it. All wrestling, all forms of wrestling is cool and stuff like that, but I mean, when I'm watching a Creed Brothers match, I'd rather see them adapt to WWE than just doing a 10-minute routine sprawling around the ring on a mat and stuff like that. It's like, it's cool what Zack Sabre Jr. does it, but he also implements his pro wrestling stuff, too. So it's like, 
sometimes I, I think the career brothers rely too much on the fact, oh, we get it. You're from amateur wrestlers. You're from Duke. We get the whole deal. But, like, got to add some charisma. Add some different elements to what you bring to your matches. Um, next question. Who do you think the throws the Usos as undisputed tag team champions, if not the Street Profits? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Again, there's a lot of there's gonna be a lot of revamping and a lot of different changes. Uh, how certain performers are gonna be uh, positioned now? Now there's a new regime, so it's kind of early to say. I mean, I could go with the Viking Raiders as the default, but they're heels, so. But the Usos are characters in a way where a lot of people appreciate them. A lot of people like the Bloodline. The Bloodline are popular. They're very good at what they do. Um, (laughs) It's just... um, For established tag teams, I could say most likely it would be... um, It would be... um, It'd be either the Viking Raiders or maybe you could say New Day down the road, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> There's not a lot of tag teams in WWE to choose from, so I, I really don't know how to answer it properly. So my best guess right now would be the Viking Raiders if it's not the Street Profits. But uh, as much people are rushing the split for the Street Profits, I do actually think one day, sooner or later, they will beat the Usos. So, so uh, don't hold your breath on that uh, Street Profits breakup scenario. Um, all right, next question from Mike. He has here, he says, um, what is the dumbest or just worst thing you remember from WCW? Does anything on Rampage compared to it? No. And I, I made jokes about, you know, Rampage being Thunder. But honestly, you know, and I've been trying to do some research on Thunder because I didn't watch all the episodes of Thunder growing up. Like, Again, I was seven years old when WCW went the fuck. Like, I did watch some aspects of WCW growing up. I I started watching wrestling in 1998. So I know a little bit about WCW uh, when I was watching it live, but it's not like I know everything off the top of my head of what they did and stuff like that. But, like, if you look at their cards and stuff like that, it's like, why would I want to watch this? Like the card that they have for Rampage this Friday. Who wants to spend an hour of their time watching that? Like, am I on pins and needles to see Parker? Uh, <laughs> like, am I on pins and needles to see uh, Parker Bordeaux against Sunny Kiss? No. <laughs> Like, no, I'm not interested to it. Like, none of these matches have any robber reasons to it. It's just stuff that's there. Like, Sammy Guevara and Ty Conti against Dante Martin and Sky Blue. Like, <laughs> like you can say that shit for, um, I don't know, Elevation or Dark or something like that. That's, that's not a match that I would want to see on television. It's just not good TV. <laughs> That's the best way I could describe it. Like, honestly, for me, you do not... It, it's true. You do not have to watch the stuff that's on this program. You really don't. It's just there to pass stats, I guess. Um. All right. What's the craziest, most expensive thing you have bought that you've regretted afterwards? <laughs> good question. That's a great one. Um, uh, does my trip <laughs> to Oviedo in 2019 count? <laughs> it wasn't, I wouldn't classify it as too expensive, but I did spend some decent money on it. But, um, do I regret having my heart broken? No, I, I'm, I'm saying it jokingly. I honestly had my heart broken and everything that went 
during that experience and then what also what I experienced last summer in Oviedo, I needed that. Um, honestly, it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me, to be honest with you. Ha- deal with that heartbreak, guys, that, that having my heart broken in 2019 is the best thing that ever happened to me. Outside of the show and my transcripts, the best thing that's ever happened to me is that I had my heart broken. And uh, it's the ultimate wake up call of life that I needed there at that moment. And I'm glad that I got through it because I could go through that. I could go through the other shit that I've gone through in my life. I could go through anything. So that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And then Mike had a couple extra questions here that I'm going to rattle off here as we wrap up this Q&A segment. Um, he said, at what point did you pick the intro songs for the show each week? Also, what goes into the thought process of how you choose it? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, a lot of the songs that I pick um, is it, twofold. Um, sometimes I will be picking out a song that I think resembles the week of wrestling. Um, like, uh, sometimes it resembles wrestling, sometimes it resembles stuff that I'm going through, um, during that week. And I think more times than not, I see the charm of having our shows done on Thursday is that it's throwback Thursday. So, I can pick a pick out a song I've been jamming to a lot for the last couple of days. Maybe it's a song I've been learning on the guitar, a song that I just really enjoy. And the process of choosing the songs for the intros is that when, depending on where you listen to this, like I don't know what you guys do. Maybe I know Sam usually listens to this show while he's working, which is cool. I don't know, like, where else you guys watch or listen to this podcast, but, like, uh, my intention when I do add the songs, when you listen to the audio version of the show, which I recommend more than the video one, (laughs) but uh, for me, my process when it comes to picking the songs is that just songs that I think could uh, help somebody um, that may be feeling down from a relationship. Um, most, Most songs are about love, unless you're listening to hip hop, and it's like the wild, wild west. They'll say anything on hip hop these days. That's why I'm not really a big fan of current hip hop artists. But, <laughs> but like, you know, it's a cool feature to have a throwback Thursday, and I could pick out a song from the '90s that I really enjoyed, or something that I listened to growing up, like Eagles and Tom Petty and stuff like that. And I'm sure you guys will probably hear that in the coming episodes. But I, I like to switch it up here and here and there. My musical taste is so all over the place, Mike, that I could go from one week listening to the country music to listening to a Jay-Z track. Uh, I could listen to Johnny Gill one week and then put on uh, a Luke Bryan song or Morgan Wallen. Like, it's very different. Certain occasions, I may sprinkle a song in there. It may have to do with something that I'm dealing with, but it's not all the time. If you can pinpoint which one it is and what I'm feeling at the moment, good on you. But uh, it's not my intention to give my real feelings of how I'm feeling during that week with every song that I choose. I want to make that perfectly clear. Uh, you know, picking the song is very important because, like, when I when I put the show together, I want it to, to be for you to just enjoy and clear your head and just enjoy the show for what it is. If you're listening to the podcast while you're driving to work or you're going out on a road trip or you're just chilling in your backyard, you know, you can put on the podcast. You can hear the funny little intro clip that I make with all the extra clips like the bad news and the shoes, please, like stuff like that. You can hear that. But but after that, you know, you have this on there. You know, you can go grab something to eat, like a small snack. You can make lunch while listening to the podcast. It's just a lot of different things I put into my mind as to putting the show together. And you get a little bit of everything with the Hoots podcast. You get production. You get music. You get comedy. Uh, you get a lot of different things, real-life conversations. So uh, choosing the song and the intro song is very important to me because it's an important part of the podcast. Um, I love music. Uh 
music was a huge part of my life growing up as a kid and it still is to this day. Uh, I do class with myself as a musician, even though I don't like practice as much as I should, or I'm not in the band or anything like that now, but Brett Carter, you know, he works, he's a music instructor. That's his life. He, um, he's a, uh, a band director. <laughs> he's like a real life band director. And, uh, Brett Carter's uh, light of work is music, and uh, music's a big part of our show. And I, I hope the songs that I pick resonate with you guys, and you guys enjoy them. <laughs> That's why I put it out there. And it, it's just different uh, tastes of music, you know. And uh, I like to switch it up. Like this week, uh, the song was uh, "Song for Another Time" by Old Dominion. I the reason why I picked that song is because I heard it on the CMT campfire sessions that they did last week. And I just enjoyed it. I thought it was a good vibe and it had a good back porch feel, you know, and it kind of similar to the back porch Q and A. So that, that's my process into how I get to uh, picking the songs each week. So I'm glad you asked that. Have you seen Woodstock 99 documentary on Netflix yet? I have not. If not, what's the last documentary you saw that resonated with you? Good question. Uh, I, I've really been watching a lot of the A and E uh, WWE uh, documentaries over the last couple weeks. Um, really enjoyed the Lex Luger one that just came out this past Sunday. Um, the one about Kurt Angle, man, I, I, I watched that uh, a couple weeks ago. It was really emotional and sad, and um, had, had even a bigger founder and new respect for Kurt Angle that I didn't even know I had already. And I, Kurt Angle is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, man. Uh, I have a big amount of respect for him. You know, the guy was perfect. He made mistakes and stuff like that too. But I, hearing his story and just owning up to what he was dealing with and trying to be better and his process of getting to where he was at the Olympics and what he put his body through and the commitment and just what he stood for. I, I have a lot of respect for Kurt Angle. I really do. Uh, the guy's a legend. And I really enjoyed that documentary. If you guys are not watching those A and E specials, they're really, really good. They're really, really good. Um, <laughs> was the best example something you heard, saw, didn't know had changed, etc. That made you feel old or different generation. Um, <laughs> probably the fact that nobody writes anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's just amazing, like. It's very rare you see anybody, like, write on a notepad anymore, unless you're, like, a kid going to school, right, you know? I I don't see people, like, writing in notebooks and stuff like that, like, everything now. Even with, like, notifications or envelopes, people even, like, get letters from anybody anymore. Like, (laughs) everything is uh, through emailing and this fucking phone and social media and all, all that. Like, do people even send anybody, like, envelopes or letters anymore? If it's not like an invitation to a wedding, you know, like do like do anybody like write out like an old fashioned letter? Like, <laughs> how about this DVDs? Do anybody still buy them? <laughs> That's probably the biggest thing for me that I noticed that I'm getting older now. Like I remember as a kid getting excited to go grab a VHS from Blockbuster uh, with my dad. We used to go. It would be like every other Friday or so, you would go to Blockbuster and go get like snacks and movies. I would get like a wrestling tape or something like that. I really enjoyed those times. Those those times were a lot of fun. Um, but um, yeah, those are probably like the the little things there that make me feel old. Like I'm not old to say I I turned 28 a few months ago, but I'm not. Old, old, I guess I could say. So those are the only ones that come off the top of my head for what I could deserve. That's a good question. Uh, last question for Mike here. He says, when, what is a song that when it comes on your driving and you feel you had to turn up, headbang, or dance to it? Well, Mike, I don't drive. <laughs> uh, that, that'd be a hazardous situation for society. I am not. Uh, a driver. I can't drive. I will never drive. <laughs> that's that's a, a a no shot. Uh, but to answer your question, is, is there a song that I uh just like bob my head to and just start dancing or whatever? There's a couple. 
I put on Twitter a couple days ago that I, I think I could get the hump the hump dance down. Uh, that, that song's a jam. <laughs> I I really enjoyed that one. The hump the hump dance is uh, not only a good like dancey song, but it's just a good song too. I, I really enjoyed the beat of that one. Um, there was a challenge they were doing on Instagram, like not my name challenge where like actors were um showing different clips of the different roles they played and you hear me? Uh, da, 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 da. That's not my name. You, you know that song? It, it's something like that. Uh, that's another good one. It's a good vibe. Somebody I used to know is a good song. Um of course I could pick any biggie song and just bob my head and you know stuff like that. Also, I, I keep that with some rock music too. I, I I grew up with a lot of good rock music. Metallica, Events Sevenfold, um, Nirvana, Foo Fighters, just a lot of different stuff. But uh, definitely the one that I can always bob my head and make sure it's, it's good vibes are Hump the Humpty Hump Dance and I Get a Rob by Tupac. That's a, another good jam that I really enjoy. Appreciate those questions, Mike. Got last set of questions here for the good brother Chris Zaletta at xtzaletta 24 x Here we go. He says, what a boost. Here's the question for the Q&A this week. Who's your winner of the G1? Well, Chris, my winner of the G1 this year is the same one that I had at the beginning of the tournament. It's Tessie and Naito. That is my pick. And we'll talk about the G1 really quick before we get to the AEW this week. Um, predictions for NXT Heat Wave. Uh, good one. Um, I have Carmelo Hayes retaining over G- uh, Giovanni Vinci or Vinny or whatever fucking acronyms you're describing him this week. <laughs> um, I think Court Jade will beat Roxanne Perez, and then I got Broad Breaker retaining over Jordan Devlin. But I think it'd be cool if Devlin won. But I I see Broad Breaker winning, and. I have Mandy Rose retaining as well over Zoe Stark. So um, those are my predictions. Oh, also, I can't forget, um, I have Tony D'Angelo beating uh, Santos Escobar. Um, I don't know how they're going to get all those matches in <laughs> next week. It's going to be – I don't know if Heatway is going to be three hours or whatever, but they got to figure that out. Like, is every match going to be fucking 18 minutes each? <laughs> like, I – these are like some big time matches uh, next week. XC should be a very good episode next week. Uh, but um, I'm curious to see how that plays out. Ooh, who will be the one to beat Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship? Well, it'll be Drew McIntyre. Yes. Or no. <laughs> Uh, thoughts of the returns of Cross and Loomis. I'll get to that in this week in WWE. Just a couple of seconds. Does Legato Del Fantasma turn on Santos at Heat Wave? No. Um, I think some way, somehow, Santos does win, but sooner or later, like, Mendoza and Wild and Electra Lopez, I think they go off and do their own thing. I, I don't see them uh, still be part of the, the Angelo family, but I can see them, you know, just doing their own thing after uh, Heat Waves over. But that's a good question. I'm curious to see what they do with them. I really am. Um, do you think there's any small chance NGF returns that all, all out? Well, I hope so. <laughs> Anything to give me hope for AW is a good thing at this point, to be honest with you. Um, anything you would done different with the women's tag title tournament? Nope. Uh, I'm glad that they're doing it. Um, I made my case of the whole women's tag team thing before. I'm not going to repeat that, but they're going to continue out with it. I'm glad that they're going to do a tournament. And, um, you know, you're going to have some interesting, interesting matches along the way. And, um, you know, this is a good opportunity for a lot of performers that are not getting TV time to get some spotlight on TV, and it's all about maximizing your TV time. So, no, I wouldn't have done anything different. Uh, the fact that they're doing it and not running away or shying away from it, it's a good thing. So, you know, whenever we do get, um, you know, Dakota Kai and EO Sky against um, 
Asuka and Alexa Bliss, that's going to be a very good match. That'll be a lot of fun to watch and transcribe. So um, we'll figure out how that goes when it gets there. But um, I'm glad that they're doing it, and it's a good opportunity for some performers to make a name for this stuff that they're not getting TV to it, uh, right now. So that's cool. Um, but I want to thank Chris, Mike, and Nate for some awesome questions this week. That concludes our edition of the Back Porch Q&A session. When we come back, we'll talk really briefly, really what happened uh, this week in WWE, uh, talk about the G1, and then get into what the hell is wrong with AW right here on the Hoots Podcast. Yes, sir. Welcome back, everybody, to the Hoots Podcast. Time to talk about what happened this week in WWE. It's going to be a brief segment this week because we got a lot to discuss and a lot to get over really quick. But first, let's take a look at what happened this past week on SmackDown from Beautiful. Let's see where SmackDown was last week. SmackDown was in Greenville, South Carolina. I got to tell you, the crowd in Greenville this past uh, uh, Friday was really good. And I'm not one on big on compliments when it comes to cities. Like, there are A towns, B towns, and C towns, like, you know, my guy John Hood would say. And, you know, Greenville, South Carolina, C town, probably in the wrestling landscape, but the crowd brought it. You know, over the past years, I've been, when I look at the calendar, see where shows are at, and like, ah, oh, fuck, there's, let's say, like, Raw in 2015, right, was in. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina, like, oh, shit, this could be a crappy crowd. Or you have, like, a Raw Des Moines, Iowa, or Austin, Texas, you know. Some of these really crap sea towns that make act next to no noise whenever the WWE comes to town. Um, I, the Greenville brought it on Friday, so I want to give a shout-out to that crowd because they did a really good job. Um, Speaking of good stuff, we had Sami Zayn still trying to get himself, consider himself part of the bloodline, and Jay Uso was reaching his boiling point. Am I not the honorary Uso? Hey, yeah, yeah, you want the truth? The truth is, the bloodline leveled up at SummerSlam, bro. Roman two times, Uso four times. If you don't start pulling your way around here, Uso, we're going to make you take that shirt off real soon. Yeah, he, he, there's one thing for wanting to be an honorary news, and then, like Jay said, you gotta do some shit. <laughs> so I, I thought that was uh, pretty funny. Uh, good stuff there. Uh, all right. Let's see how things go from here. So, yeah, a couple of matches started off the show. The first one was Ricochet and Baron Corbin. By the way, the Pat McAfee Telestrator thing that kicked off the show was absolutely hilarious. I was crying laughing. It was just fantastic stuff. Uh, Ricochet defeated Baron Corbin with a shoe star press. Very good match. Uh, had the recoil set up, of course, towards the uh, core of the uh, ring there. And uh, that was a very um, good match there. Nakamura beat uh, Lugo and Kaiser. Very good match. Uh, what happened, though, was um, Nakamura's going to be fighting Gunta, uh, the ring general, uh, coming up tomorrow night on SmackDown for the Intercontinental Championship. That is going to be a lot of fun. That may be my match of the week. I'm curious to see how that match goes. I think they'll get some time. That's going to be awesome. That's going to be a barn burger. I am looking forward to it. Would you believe it or not, it took two weeks for the fickle WWE Universe to start booing Liv Morgan. Liv better win money to make or else. Liv Morgan better win the SmackDown Women's Championship or else. Oh, Liv better not lose to Ronda Rousey or else. Liv Morgan has escaped her plan. Maybe didn't like the, the finish of the match or whatever. But she's still your SmackDown Women's Champion. Greenville, South Carolina, you dropped the ball here. I gave you props earlier. Now I have to call you out of your shit. Booing this girl for what? <laughs> ah. Again, we Twitter loves to push these houses in certain positions. And once they get there, oh, we got to start booing them. Boo, 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 boo. All right. 
That's why I always say be careful what you wish for, pal. Um, all right. Uh, next part of the show was the Women's Gauntlet match which she saw Shayna Baszler uh, win. Shayna Baszler will now be taking out Liv Morgan for the SmackDown Women's Championship at Clash of the Castle. Um, wasn't too crazy with the stuff with uh, Kofi Kingston and the Fight Raiders. That was what it was. Um, what everybody's been talking about this week was the return of Karrion Cross. First off, we had the promo say with Roman Reigns, Drew McIntyre. I, I did get it pop out of the Tribal Queef comment. I thought that was pretty funny. Everybody knows Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre are going to deliver a barn burger at Clash of the Castle. But the dynamics here, of course, it's great to see Chicago's finest waterfall back on our television screens. Uh, Scar Bordeaux was back on uh, SmackDown with Karrion Cross. Whole visual, what everybody wanted to see. It was just... Awesome, man. It really was. So I, I really I really enjoy SmackDown. I, I'm really happy for Cross. Everybody knows that's listening to the Who's Podcast knows how big of a fan I am of that guy and he has a lot of potential and he's gonna do a lot of good stuff and I just I love how they introduced him back to the audience. I thought I thought it was really cool. They did a fantastic job and I'm curious to see what he does tomorrow. I, I really am. And I had somebody Ask me about it. If it was me, I would just have Cross for now, lay low, and do a couple of vignettes, kind of like they did with NXT. In, you know, maybe have him have a sit down interview with Michael Cole. You know, I think that'd be really good. Or Caleb Braxton, wherever you want to do it. I think that'd be very interesting. But, um, yeah, good shit there. It was very good. I, I, I got really excited when I saw that. That, that. that was probably my top of the week was seeing Cross back on TV. So I thought that was cool. Now, when you see the title of this episode, and I say mistake by the lake, you just think I'm going to trash quick by the lake. And I'm going to, and I'll get to that later on, but I said mistake by the lake in a positive sense here too, because Raw was in Cleveland, unfortunately, <laughs> this past Monday night. And, and, and as I preface this, again, when I say mistake by the lake... I'm not referencing that something went wrong on Raw this week. The only thing that was wrong was that this show's in fucking Cleveland. It sucks. It sucks. It sucks. It sucks. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, man. Cleveland, Ohio, and Cle- uh, Ohio in general is the armpit of life. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Oh my god, it's bro, it's brutal. Bob Evans, JoJo Dutch, whatever phrase you want to use. Oh man, I saw somebody on Twitter compare C. P. J. Mossy to Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. I like to have what you're smoking, pal. Um, anyways, <laughs> let's get to what happened on Raw. Raw started off hot with uh, the announcement that Bailey. Uh, Eos Sky and uh, Dakota Kai will be taking on Bianca Belair, Alexa Bliss, and Asuka at Clash of Castle in a six woman tag team match. Pure Six Brawl Jones, uh, the kid got so hot and ready. A uh, crowd was into it, I was into it. Um, a couple matches from Raw that really stood out to me, and Raw's really been emphasizing some longer matches recently. Uh, Seth Rollins and Angelo Dawkins, I thought it was very good. Again, start putting some respect on this damn dude's name. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, let me pull up something really quick here as I'm talking to you guys. And, um, just give me one second to find here. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, Seth Rollins and Ansel Dawkins put on a really good match. And, uh, Seth Rollins later on in the show was, uh, poking run and, uh, poking fun at Riddle doing a pretty good, uh, Riddle impression. I thought that was pretty cool. Um. Usually we don't really play clips from Raw Talk, but I thought there was a couple good ones here that stood out to me. So let's hear what happened on Raw Talk this week. I'm talking to Damien. So you want to ask if I have a set? I accept your challenge. Do you have a set to leave your gothic bookends at home and face me one-on-one? See, you forget, man. When you first started in WWE, who'd you call? who was always there no matter what time of night you called me for advice. It was me. So when I had the idea of the Judgment Day, it was a no-brainer. You, Rhea Ripley, let's do it. You struck the first blow. You tore it apart. 
You want to tear apart? You want to try and end my career in my hometown? 30 years after I started it in that very hometown, you want to do that? You want to test me like that, priest? Man, there's going to be a point during that match. You're going to be lying in that ring. You're going to look up at me, and I'm going to stand over top of you. I'm going to say, son, you don't understand the mistake you made. But I'm going to make you see it. I'll see you in Toronto, kid. Sarah, in the short amount of time that we've been here, we have created fear in this division. We have controlled this division. So it doesn't matter if it's Nikki and Dewdrop or Oscar and Alexa, all right? Fact of the matter is, none of them can hang with us and none of them can lace our boots. Anyway, we're gonna become women's tag team champions! Yes, yes they are. Well, if you don't face Alexa Bliss and Oscar for the titles, you will be facing them in a six women tag, including you as well as the Raw Women's Champion, Bianca Belair. What are your thoughts on that? Wait, at Clash of the Castle. Uh, yeah, I gotta wait. Okay, we waited long enough, okay? <laughs> so don't tell me to wait anymore. Don't tell Ia to wait. Don't tell Dakota to wait mm -hmm. because we are done waiting and we cannot wait to Clash at the Castle because we're going to make all three of them pay for what they've done to this division. It's ours now. And so are those tag team titles. <laughs> are you done? Spoilers. I am. Spoilers. Are you done? Spoilers. Thank, Spoilers. You. Thank you so much for your time night. and congrats. Yeah, we got stuff to do. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, guys. Omos obliterating his opponents in a two-on-one handicap match. MVP, is it safe to say we saw a new level of aggression from your Nigerian giant tonight? Obliterating. That's a good word. I like that. It's safe to say that what you've seen tonight was not just a new level of aggression, but a new level of ruthlessness, a new level of understanding. See, what I do is I help people unlock their true potential. And I am helping Omos understand what he's truly capable of. And when you see that he's getting that now. See, I told you that me and the Nigerian giant are going all the way to the top. <laughs> and if you want to find us, follow the bodies. <laughs> <laughs> follow the bodies? <laughs> Damn! <laughs> That's pretty good line there. I like that. Follow the bodies. I like that. Let's continue on here for Raw. Like I said, uh, there's a lot of different threats on the show. Uh, we saw Kevin Owens go back to his ways, uh, powered by him and Ezekiel to, and sending him to the gulags. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, the threat with Edge and uh, the Mysterios and Judgment Day. Things are getting interesting there. Uh, getting closer and closer to what may be the uh, eventual heel turn to Dominic Mysterio. Let's see how that goes. Uh, Finn Balor and Rey Mysterio had a good match. Finn Balor won. Uh, Rhea Ripley just absolutely molly uh, Rey Mysterio, uh, he No, she molly -wopped. Dominic Mysterio, my bad. Uh, speaking of Kevin Owens, Kevin Patrick ca uh, caught up to Kevin Owens in the backstage area on Raw. You want to know why I did what I did? See, because I'm like that idiot out there who doesn't seem to know who he is. I know exactly who I am. I'm Kevin Owens. And I've been gone a little while, but I know... There's more eyes on this show now than there's been in a long time. So I thought tonight, tonight was the perfect opportunity to remind everybody in the back and everybody watching that this, this is still the Kevin Owens show. You want to Good stuff there. Uh, Bobby Lashley, Tommaso Ciampa, United States Championship match. Um... I saw a lot of people this week were talking about why are they do all these video packages and highlights and stuff like that if Tommaso Ciampa is going to lose. Well, you're just going to just run through Bobby Lashley like nothing? <laughs> um, it's like, oh, it didn't make sense for AJ Styles and The Miz to brawl the outside. Well, wasn't it uh, The Miz that cost AJ Styles the opportunity to fight? Uh, Bobby Lashley for the United States Championship. I mean, <laughs> we gotta watch the show, ladies and gentlemen. It's a drop it on hot takes. Talked about the riddle thing. Uh, Chad Gable, Doss Ziggler, another good match. Um, and then, of course, the uh, the main event, AJ Styles and the Miz for uh, those qualification match. I thought that was cool. That ended up being the case there, and we saw uh, Dexter Loomis. Um, appear in the background 
for um, the cliffhanger because there's a backstage incident back there where we're trying to figure out what's going on out there. Did somebody crash into the parking lot? Things all chaos is consuming, and then out comes Lex Loomis being detained by Cleveland police officers. Can you detain the Sean Watson too? Or that's a, a nice show to have, right? Uh, anyways, <laughs> again, I thought Raw and SmackDown was very good this week. Both shows. I can't pick one that was better from the other. I really enjoyed it. Uh, here is the lineup for NXT UK today. As we have Oliver Kata taking Charlie Dempsey. That should be very good. We have Tia Hale of Chase University taking on Eliza Alexander. Sam Gredwell will take on Tio Man. Very good match there. That should be good. And also the main event for um, today is uh, Trent Seven against Wolfgang for the uh, NXT UK Championship Tournament that's taking place right now. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. It's an eight-man tournament. Obviously, on the other side of the bracket, you got Tyler Bay against Kenny Williams and Joe Coffey against Mark Andrews. So we're going to get some bar burners along the way on this NXT UK Championship Tournament. Definitely, it's going to look like it's going to be Trent Seven and Tyler Bate in the finals, which I have absolutely no problem with. Yeah, it could be a predictable tournament, but th- this this could be good, and I'm very excited for NXT UK today. That should be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. So, yeah, all in all, folks, that's my thoughts on what happened this week in WWE. When we come back, give you a little update as far as what's going on with the G1 as we're reaching closer and closer to that final stretch of G1 shows. And we're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. Five more G1 shows to go. And all documented on ProWrestlingTransfusions.com. But we'll get to that next, right here on the Who's Podcast. Alright, guys, one more thing to go here before we get to our main event segment. Uh, don't forget, following What the Hell is Wrong AW is the return of the Thoughts of Derrico. So, hope you guys are excited for that. Uh, we have <laughs> the G1 Climax 32 update for today. And I have a couple pieces of audio that I want to play for you guys. Because uh, um, some very, very funny promos to play before I get into the whole standings and everything that's going on with the G1. Uh, I'm very happy. It's been a very busy couple days on my end. The last couple weeks it's, in general has just been busy for me, uh, transcript-wise. But very excited to talk about it. But for context, there was a tag match a couple days ago that featured Royce Isaacs and Tom Waller, Team Filthy, right? Taking on uh, Zack Sabre Jr. And I think it was Taki Nishidoka, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Team Filthy won that match. Listen to a very irate Zack Sabre Jr. I think you're going to enjoy this. Those filthy bastards! Team Filthy! Team Disgusting! Keep denying y'all! Because I... Yeah, I don't know what... I don't know what they smell of. They smell of cigarettes, late nights, and regret. It's disgusting. It's all over me. The stench of it. The absolute stench. The standards are slipping here. Where's the hygiene? We're still in the middle of a pandemic. Are oh, you bastards all wearing masks? What me? My skin. It's disgusting. And the most disgusting thing about Team Filthy, Tommy. Tommy, how very dare you. That's sacrilege. I will not have a single bad word spoken about George Michael. Zack Sabre Jr., the greatest technical wrestler in the world, guided by George Michael. We will not tolerate that. Boy, George is wonderful, but he's not George Michael, is he? Disgusting! (laughs) Oh, my God. Um, So, the context here for that is that... um, during the match, Tom Waller said that George Michael sucks. And if you follow New Japan Pro Wrestling and you follow Zack Sabre Jr., you know that his internal inspiration to help him through matches is George Michael music. Okay, he's a fan of George Michael. No problem with that. Uh, George Michael is a little before my time, so I, I didn't really uh, watch or experience uh, George Michael uh, when he was popular during the 80s and stuff. I was born in 94, so forgive me. Uh, but, again, 
I, I just thought it was a hilarious, hilarious promo. So I, I, I wanted to play it after you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Here is the updating, updated standings as we stand here for the G1 on August 11th, uh, 2022. Um, the next two sets of G1 shows are coming up in Machida coming up this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. So no G1 shows tomorrow. Hallelujah. I did a three pack last week and last weekend and that was rough. <laughs> Not the shows were bad, but the it's just a lot of work. Uh but here's the current standings as we stand here right now for the G1. Um in A block, Okada is at first place with eight points. Jonah and Lance Archer have a second place tie with six points, and Jeff Cobb is still in the running uh for the G1 with four points. He has uh two matches coming up with um, Toriano and then Filthy Tom Waller. Now, anything can happen here. Lance Archer, all he has to do to get to the finals is beat Okada. He has one match left. Jonah has one match left as well. Uh, I think his last match is with Fale. I could be wrong. But I'll look into that. But anyways, Okada kind of controls the cards, but also Jonah controls his cards too because Jonah has a tiebreaker over Okada because he the the lone loss that Okada had it was to Jonah. So very interesting how that plays out. As we get to the B block, we have um, Jay White and Thomas Hunter tied for first place with eight points. Sonata is still almost in the running for the G1. Uh, he has six points. His final match is against Ishii. Uh, that's going to be a bar burner. That's taking place on um, the 16th, uh, which is, should be Tuesday, right? Yeah, Tuesday is going to be a crazy show. They're doing all block matches that day. That's going to be a long one. Um, Thomas Hawk and Jay White has been a story for the whole A block. Uh, my bad, for the whole B block. It's, the whole mind games thing that I said in the beginning when we started uh, previewing this year's uh, G1 tour and um, all the things with Tom and Tommy being exiled from Bullet Club. And I'm curious to see how that plays out. I really am. Because the last uh, league match for Tom and Taga is Jay White. Um, he has already had five matches uh, for Jay White. He has a match with Tai Chi on Saturday. And then uh, again, again against Tom Tonga on the 16th. So that's going to be interesting there. Then we get to a very interesting scenario in the C block. Um, Hiroki Goto and Hiroshi Tanahashi put on a barn burner yesterday as I'm recording this. Uh, the August 10th edition of the G1. Go check it out. You want to see your quintessential strong style G1 style match? It was Goto and Tanahashi. Very good, well paced. Um, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, Zack Sabre Jr., as I mentioned, is the current block leader with eight points. He has one more match left, and that is with Tetsuya Naito. So that's the thing here. Naito is an interesting position right here because uh, Naito has a tiebreaker scenario where he could get to first place if he beats Zack Sabre Jr. and Goto loses the evil, Naito will win the C block. From what I'm seeing right now, that's what that's what's gonna happen. If Zack Saber wins, he's in. That's all he has to do. He has to beat Naito. Goto. It's a very interesting scenario with Goto here because uh he could get to eight points. He could possibly win the G1 because he has the tiebreaker over Naito. Naito lost to Goto. If we're not mistaken. So right now we're kind of tied down to Goto, Zack Saber Jr., and Naito. Um I guess you could say Tanahashi could be in the mix because Tanahashi has the uh tiebreaker over Zack Saber Jr. Uh and he would have to be Kenta, which would be on the 16th as well. Uh, again, I'm gonna get to that August 16th card and tell you guys how stacked and loaded that is, but some interesting scenarios to play out there. As we get to the D block, th again, I, I knew this was going to be the Wild Wild West because literally everybody's still in, in live in, for this um, standings and who could make it to the semifinals. Uh, 
Believe it or not, Yutro Takahashi and David Finley are tied at first with six points, with everybody else having four points. A uh, lot of matches for the D Block in the coming weekends. Uh, you know, Shingo has two more matches. Yoshihashi has two more matches. Will Osprey has two more matches. Uh, Juice and El Fantasma will have one more match to go. Um, same thing applies with Yujiro and Dave Philly. So there's going to be some spirited matches and some desperation in these next couple of shows. And that's the charm of the G1 as we're getting close to this. Uh, this whole format with the four blocks and everything has been very interesting to cover. This is the this is the this probably the most unique G1 that I've ever covered in my career. Uh, I'm saying that for a shoot. Uh, for real, it, it's probably the most unique G1 that I ever covered. Okay, so here's the lineup for Saturday in Machida uh, for the block matches. We have Kenta against Aaron Hanare. Kenta has two more matches, uh, Aaron Hanare on uh, Saturday and then Tanahashi on Tuesday. Um... Jeff Cobb will be taking on Toriyama, like I mentioned earlier. Shingo will be taking on Yushiro Takahashi. Big match for Shingo. He wins. He gets to go back into first place. Will Ospreay will be taking on Yoshihashi. That's going to be a bar burner. And Jay White in Tai Chi is the main event on Saturday. That's going to be cool. Sunday in Nagano uh, will be interesting. There's only four block matches on that particular show. It's um, let me take a swig of water really quick. Yes, uh, it's um, Dave Finley against Yoshihashi. Um, you have Tai Chi against the Great Okan, all hail. Jeff Cobb against Filthy Tom Waller. Big time match right there. Because if Tom Waller beats Jeff Cobb, Jeff Cobb cannot win the A block. He'll be out. Uh, he'll miss out on that. Um, Hiroshi Tanahashi against Kenta is the main event. Of that show on Sunday. So scratch that. I thought that was going to be on the 16th. Never mind. Tanahashi and Kenta is the main event on Sunday. So Kenta has a back to back G1 performances. <laughs> it's going to be some good post match promos for Kenta, but it's going to be a long weekend for him. All right. I talked enough about the August 16th card. And this is where, where things are going to get down and crazy here. But. Let's go from the bottom to the top here, okay? Will Ospreay against Juice Robinson in a D block. Shingo Takagi against El Phantasmo. Again, D block. Naito, Zack Sabre Jr., C block. Evil and Goto, C block. Jay White and Tamatanga, B block. Ishii and Sanada. B block. Have you ever seen a bad Ishii Sonata match? You haven't. <laughs> Jonah and Bad Luck Fale in A block. And then Okada's last match for the G1 this year is against Lance Archer for block competition purposes. I don't know what's going to happen, but you have like five or six bar burners on this card alone. Look at that. Will Osprey Juice Robson. Juice Robson stole the IWGP United States title away from Will Osprey. Shingo and El Fantasmo. That's going to be awesome. Naito, Sack Saber Jr. Sack Saber Jr. cost Naito his chance to win a G1 last year. Evil and Goto. Look at, this, look at the run Goto's been having in the G1 this year. Does Evil ruin that for everybody? Jay White and Tamataga, I talked about the history there. That's going to be a grudge feud. Ishii Sonata. Jonah Bell. Honestly, this may be the card of the year so far for New Japan Pro Wrestling, and I'm not lying. If you look at that lineup alone, the stories and the rivalries that go into this predicament and all the 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 scenarios to play out, like, <laughs> I don't know how Chris Johnson is not going to explode with trying to figure out what's going to happen here. I... Honestly, guys, August 16th for the Nip, Nippon Budokan because um, we have the 16th going to be the final night of block matches. And then Wednesday is the semifinals, and then the finals will be on Thursday. So you may be getting this podcast a little later, guys, next week, just to forewarn you. But some way, somehow, I do believe Naito and Shingo will come out of the deep 
see D blocks. I do believe that. Um, I'm bummed out that my guy Ishii will not be there, but Jay White will probably win, and Okada will probably win that one. So you have Naito, Shingo, and Okada and Jay White in the semifinals. Just think about that alone. That's just moth watering from a typing point of view. Uh, <laughs> that's that's my update for G1 right now. It's it's just an awesome time to be a New Japan Pro Wrestling fan right now, and there's a lot to look forward to. I'm very, very excited. So, with that being said, it's time to give the people what they want, what they need. Another brand new edition, restaurant quality, pal, of what the hell is wrong with AEW. Let's start this off with Bert Carter via satellite this week in a three, a two, a one. Beat your meat. Beat, beat your meat. 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 It's time for... What the hell is wrong with AEW? What the hell is wrong with AEW? Well, I'm sorry I have to be via satellite this week, but that's not going to stop me from giving my opinion on this absolutely godforsaken, terrible, bullshit show that we managed to see this week. So, talk about the things that I liked real quick. And there was two things I liked this week. The first thing was Ricky Starks. I'm really happy with with what's happening with Ricky Starks. I think he looks good. I'm thrilled that he's been featured on television every week for the last little while. AEW is setting him up to be a major player, and I'm all about it. I'm a big fan of Ricky Starks. I like what they're doing with him, and I like Ricky Starks. I hope it leads to something great for him. And then, of course, the final segment and the unexpected return of CM Punk, which we'll get to here in a little bit. That was very cool. Looks like we're going to have the all-out main event. And once again, Dave Meltzer was wrong. As they're like, oh, you know, Punk's going to be gone for a while. Shocking. The major dirt sheet guy who is probably the worst journalist in the history of sports journalism was wrong yet again. Yet somehow his word is gospel. I don't get it. If you can figure it out. Please let me know. But let's get to the crap this week. And oh boy, was there a lot of crap. Okay, we start with the coffin match. One minute into the match, Brody King is blading and bleeding all over the place. And, you know, he managed to cut himself pretty good. I think he overloaded with blood. um, And I wasn't sure what was happening with that. Uh, Buddy Matthews is back for some reason after not being on TV for a while. Fine. But this was boring and uninteresting. I had such high hopes for Darby Allen as he's an incredible athlete who has a very unique character. However, he wants to be nothing more than a stuntman. As I mentioned, this was boring, uninteresting, had no fluid to it, and quite frankly, was just stupid. Why does Chris Jericho always feel the need to cuss in his promos? It's just not believable. Interesting to see him with the clean cut and kind of doing that. It was different, fine, but he's just not believable anymore. Andrade Alidalu and Roosh versus the Lucha Bros. Cool to see the Lucha Brothers back again. But this was just a random spot fest between two teams that were simply drawn out of a hat by Tony Khan in the back. That's what, that's what these spot fest trampoline matches are at this point. They just pick two names out of a hat and said, okay, you're going to go have a little uh, trampoline match this week. It just seems like that's what this is. Why did Penta stop a pin attempt just to do another spot? He'd pin the guy... Got him for a one count, and then all of a sudden, he just stopped to do another spot. JR summed this up perfectly when he said, This is a train wreck! Decent promo from Matt Jackson, but the problem is is I have no reason to care about it. The heel turn came out of nowhere last week, and everything is just very inconsistent in the storytelling. I have no reason to care about this. Still don't like the Young Bucks, even though this was a somewhat decent promo from Matt Jackson. You know, you could totally tell he was full of shit, so that was fine. Um, but yeah, there's just no, there's no consistency with this. I don't care. And of course we don't see Cole, O'Reilly and Fish this week to explain their actions. Why would we do that? Why would we have consistency in their storytelling? (sighs) 
Luchasaurus beats up a jobber for some reason, and then we get some bull crap between Christian Cage and Jungle Boy. This was stupid. Uh, it just no consistency at all. And, but, well, speaking of consistency, apparently Miro is targeting House of Black now? Why? What did they do? I don't have a reason to be emotionally engaged each week. I just I don't know what I'm going to get from week to week. And when was the last time we saw Miro in the ring? Like, what has he done that of anything of any consequence and substance in AEW? Oh, wait, it's been nothing. And I say it everywhere, every week. I now see why WWE got rid of him. Man, there was a really bizarre and strange segment with the TNT Championship. I thought FTR returning was going to be a big deal. But instead, they just come out, hit the big rig on Jay Lethal or whoever it was. And that was it. Boy, great moment for the return of probably your most popular act and what some might say is the best tag team in the world. <sighs> then we get Jade Cargill and Madison Rain. I thought this was going to be great. I was wrong. This was sloppy. This wasn't good. Uh, it's unfortunate because both of those wrestlers are very good, I think. Anyway, Jade Cargill's got an incredible look. I do not know why she's not featured on television every week. But... I mean, if Madison, if that's what Madison Rain can do in the ring, and I love Madison Rain, don't get me wrong, but if that's what she can do in the ring and she's going to be the coach, yeah. This was a sloppy ending, um, and it looks like Athena is next for some random reason, I'm guessing because Chris Statlander got hurt. So I don't know. I, Jade has got to get away from AEW ASAP. She needs to go to NXT, spend some time getting trained by professionals. She's got an incredible look. She can talk well. But she's got to work on her in-ring ability. If she can figure that out and start working with some professionals, she could be a megastar. And then we get to the main event. Chris Jericho, the Lionheart Chris Jericho, versus John Moxley, too. And, of course, we get excessive blood from Moxley when Jericho ripped the earring out of Moxley's, you know. I don't think... I don't think he's capable of having a match without bleeding everywhere. I mean, that's just what Moxley does. He wants to be in CZW so bad. It's unbelievable. And Guevara wasn't even close with that bat throw. And, I mean, like, he missed completely. And then, of course, Jericho was openly bleeding. I, I, I wrote down, if this was an actual wrestling match, I might have enjoyed it. But the blood was so excessive, and Jericho was trying so hard to throw back to his 1996 character that... It was just so distracting and uninteresting, and I was so bored because AEW does this kind of crap all the time. They rely on the hardcore blood stuff all the time, and it just doesn't mean anything. And then, of course, we get a random post-match brawl because why wouldn't there be? You know, that's just what AEW does. Uh, as I said, I think I would have enjoyed this if there was a decent wrestling match, but the overtop blood right from the start was so distracting. CM Punk comes back. He's going to get his match with Moxley at All Out, I would assume. They've got three weeks to actually build this thing up, which, again, I'm not going to give me any reason to care about this. So don't know why I'm going to pay for this pay-per-view, which I won't. Don't know why I'm supposed to care about this wrestling show, which I don't. And I don't know what anybody sees in this wrestling promotion that is sinking faster than the heaviest stone in the middle of the ocean. It's going downhill. AEW is going to be out of business within five years. Just you wait and see. Seriously, what the hell is wrong with AEW? This has been What the Hell is Wrong with AEW. Thank you, Brother Carter. As always, appreciate you, my man. Make sure to follow Brother Carter, by the way, on Twitter at Derek Stoughton. That's S-T-O-U-G-H-T-O-N. Or as I like to say, <laughs> S-T-A-H-T-O-N. Stoughton. <laughs> <laughs> Derek Statton. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, to Joshi's portion of What the Hell is Wrong with AEW, a.k.a. What is it wrong with AEW? You know, a common thing that I always hear on Twitter that just blows my mind about people who cover AEW, and they say, this is a prime example of why it's good to not have people script your promos. Well, if that's the case, 
Tell me, what the fuck was this? We are back on down. Wipe down, Shabani. Shabani! I can feel it! The world can feel it! Daddy Magic Weird is lucky red! History will be made tonight! John Moxley! It's been a hell of a one, man. It's been a hell of a one. But it comes to an end tonight! Because tonight is the Jericho Championship Appreciation Party, guys. Did you see the spread back there? I mean, there's hors d'oeuvres, a moves and boozers. Heck, we even got a fondue, Shabani. You were not invited, by the way. The best of debt. We got a little bit of a bubbly because it's time for the AEW Galaxy to appreciate. And while we're speaking of appreciation, you know who should appreciate me? Brian Danielson. Brian, I put you on another paid vacation with your family and your garden. Brian, I put you to sleep. I own you. Because I'm a dragon slayer. Hey! You! You don't think he's a dragon slayer, huh? I'm going to choke you. Get him, Albus! Get him! Uh, oofa, oofa, oofa. I'm going to be up front with you, and I'm going to put in the description that this segment is what Twitter won't tell you about AEW. Because that's really what we do here on the Hoots Podcast. We give you the straight and narrow. We give it 100. Sometimes to a fault, and I don't believe in that. I'm not, I don't run away from my point of view of things, and I... I am an open book to a fault. But again, I think I'd be doing this service to you guys if I wasn't doing this. We don't do this bit for comedy purpose. My intention is not to be a character or gimmick that I'm the anti-AW guy. I want this to be as good as just as anybody else. But I'm not going to sit here and lie to you with a straight face and tell you how awesome this show is because it's not. And I'm not going to let misleading crowds that are just hot because they're at a TV 14 wrestling taping. So that means they have free reign to say and cheer as loud as they want. Because that's the thing now these days. You're, the nature of your odds is dictated by the, the, the rating of the television show. Look, good. You got loud drinking adults in the dumpiest part of Minnesota. Awesome. Fantastic. But again... That doesn't preclude me from watching the show and say, What the fuck is going on out there? Ricky starts against Aaron Solo. Who gives a shit? FTR and Warlow getting into the brawl with Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satna Singh. Again, repeat with me. Who gives a shit? Also, let's, let's scroll up back a little bit. Luchasaurus against Anthony Henry for the third time. Who gives a shit? Big thing this week to uh, develop the promo uh, feud with Christian Cage and uh, Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy runs after Christian. Luchasaurus headbutts Pat Buck. Whoopity fucking do. I ask myself, why, why, why do I, why do I put myself through this? I don't want people to come to the show and be like, "Oh, this is the negative zone. We're negative this. We're negative that." But at some point, it's frustrating. I'm not personally offended by why by what I watch on AW. It's a wrestling show. This show, the premise of professional wrestling is not to satiate your intellectual IQ scores. But AEW does a great job of making me question what the fuck I'm watching or you know, you know what I mean? So I played the General Hospital theme last week to symbolize the stuff with the young bugs and no follow up from uh the the elite right no, nothing from uh Adam Cole and Red Dragon no, nothing no teasing them on rampage nothing so we have the young bugs had this melodramatic conversation in the backstage area with Heyman Page and the Dark Order so we're going to have this trios tournament for another title that is not necessary uh, I thought I thought it was pretty funny that um, this week AEW advertised that we're gonna have a tornado tag match. Uh, as I put in the description of this podcast this week, AEW does a great job of false advertising. One, 
false advertising that we're going to get an alternative wrestling product. A false advertising saying that we're going to have a tag team match. Um, we're going to have a tornado tag match. No, we're having the AEW tag team match. <laughs> Rush and Andre and Oni Oni uh, taking on the Lucha Brothers. That was a regular AEW tag team match. That was there was nothing tornado about it. You had the dead courts ref in there. You had spots that make no sense. It, only in AW that a referee could fuck up a tornado match. This match was a complete and utter clusterfuck. Then we go back all the way to the beginning of the show. Darby Allen against Brody King. Not even two minutes into the match. Color. Brody King is bleeding out like a stuffed pig. Darby Allen. Get into a Pier 6 brawl. All this stuff. This match goes for 18 minutes to start off the show. Coffin match. What a way to start off a wrestling show than with a coffin match, right? So Darby Allen wins. During the match, we see the return of Buddy Matthews and uh, everybody in the House of Black. Again, Tony Khan with his fascination with ECW for the night. He's got to turn off the fucking lights in the building every week. We get it. It's the House of Black. Nobody else is getting surprised when the lights are turned off. So the lights turn out, go out, out comes House of Black, and they're intimidated by a six year old man waving around a baseball bat. All due respect to Sting, but again, when I'm supposed to be intimidated by this faction or even scared, you know, I, th this is a, a faction that I have to take seriously. But they kowtow and back away and you make Buddy Matthews look like a fucking geek against Sting on his return like what are we doing here the best part of the match was the finish only in the way that they had the lid come down when Brody King fall into the coffin I thought that was nice outside of that that match sucked <laughs> I was watching this first hour of the show and I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? We got CCW wrestling to start off the show. We got Days of Our Life and all our friends wrestling. We got shitty backstage promos. We got squash matches and matches that we can see on AW Dark. And this was the first hour alone. The first hour alone. Again, who in the right mind wants to see FTR and Wardlow against... Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satman Singh. Why is this group still a thing? It fucking sucks. Jay Cargill and Madison Raid. Nobody gave two shits about this match. Which is unfortunate because I'm a big fan of Madison Raid. And I'm a big fan of Jay Cargill. Jay Cargill retains... Now, here's AEW's Infinite Wisdom. Let's have a babyface attack a heel from behind after the match is over. Great shit, Tony Khan. Just awesome stuff. Then, <laughs> Orange Cassidy. Let me, I, I can't believe I'm reading off this lineup for Rampage. Let me just get to this. So, we have Brian Danielson on the show. Going to preview his two out of three falls match coming up with Jamie Kennedy. My bad, uh, Daniel Garcia. Uh, Hook will talk on the show. Look at these matches on the card. The Gun Club against Dan Clownson and Eric Redbeard. Parker Bordeaux against Sonny Kiss from an angle that happened on AW Dark this week. Orch Cassidy against Arya Davari and Sammy Guevara and Ty Mello now. <laughs> Ty Mello, okay, whatever. By the way, congratulations on your guys' wedding. Uh, they'll be taking out Dante Martin and Sky Blue in a mixed tag team match. Listen to what I just said there. Are you any intrigued by watching Rampage this week? This may be the most JoJo Dutch match card I've ever seen in my entire life. Hell, even you can't get bad at these cards on... What was that um, Saturday morning show that they did recently for WWE? Let me pull it up. WWE Saturday... Yeah, Saturday Morning Slam. <laughs> 
Rampage is reaching that territory for me. It's Velocity bad. It's Shotgun Saturday Night bad. It's... <sighs> Hell, even me calling Rampage Thunder is an insult to Thunder. <laughs> so, again, I watch this shit and it's like, what's the point? And then John Moxley... Chris Jericho. Now, I've been very, very critical of John Moxley. I've been very critical of Chris Jericho. I have. So, I watched this match. Outside of the predictable color that... Of course, you can't have a John Moxley match, especially with him on uh, It's a Main Event without his ass bleeding, right? You can't have a match with Moxley without color. He, he just can't do it. Jericho's bleeding out of the stuff pig. Of course, we got all this revisionist history where Jericho's now suddenly the last survivor of the Heart Dungeon. Yeah, uh, the, the last survivor of Ed Langley and Brad Young as trainers. Can we get some actual footage of Stu actually training this fucking guy? No, because it didn't happen! So, we have John Moxley, Chris Jericho, one match. We'll see how it goes. That was okay in certain parts. Doing a Walls Jericho for the entire picture to picture segment was a waste of my time. Um, I liked the finish of the match. That was it. I liked some aspects of the match, but again, when you get to this part of the show and it's like you wait for one good thing on the show, and me and Brett Carr would always rely on Edge to be there to find one positive thing. To point out from the show each week. And here we are. John Moxley retains. Gang warfare. Because the the January 6th appreciators coming down to the ring. Taking on uh, the Blackpool comic. The Blackpool Country Club. And Kingston Ortiz. The same shit we've been seeing for a year and a half. Gang warfare. Good. There's a lot of afterbirth brawls on this show, by the way, too, which I noticed. By the way, I was going to forget this. Nobody in their right mind can tell me, unless you're fucking Stevie Wonder, that freaking Don Stevens did not see Chris Jericho attack Moxley with that baseball bat. Don Stevens is the most in incompetent referee in professional wrestling today. And it's not close. So going back to this Pier 6 brawl. Out comes CM Punk. CM Punk's back. And only AEW. Would put me in position. Where my favorite wrestler is on TV. Comes back from injury. And I have no emotion. I'm not marking out. I, I, have, I have no feeling inside of enjoyment. Because I don't give a shit about John Moxley against CM Punk. I already seen it. Desperate time calls for desperate measures, and I guess uh, Rick Moranis started to feel like he was losing some momentum from the dirt sheet crowd because um, you know everything that's going on else around the industry. Oh, we got to get the attention back on us. The only thing Tony Khan has in his back pocket is CM Punk and just trying to recreate that pop that happened at the United Center on August 20th. Tony, it's never going to happen again. You're not going to top that moment. And good on you that you're able to make that moment happen. And I'm happy that CM Punk is back. But you are not going to recreate that energy that happened that time when CM Punk came back the first time. Yeah, of course Minnesota was going to cheer for them. They have nothing else to fucking cheer for. 
if anything, CM Punk came to add to the ring was their fucking Super Bowl this year. Do you think the Viking fans were going to get excited for their upcoming season? Come on. So, all in all, another week, another AW Dynamite, Quake by the Lake, a.k.a. Mistake by the Lake. And that, my friends, is what the hell's wrong with AEW this week. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you guys for hanging us for another fun edition of the Hoots Podcast, another fun episode in the books. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts from. Google, Stitcher, Spotify, what? Apple Podcasts, what? Anywhere you get your podcasts from, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Just type in Hoots Podcast and you'll find it there for your viewing and listening pleasures. You can check out Brian Carr's work at DerekStoughton.com and check out his work at WrestlingRivers.net. You can uh, check out my work uh, writing-wise at ProWrestlingTranscriptions.com. And as always, remember, be the authentic be the authentic product that is yourself. And remember, nobody dictates the pace of your life but yourself and the man upstairs. I love you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, make sure to enjoy some wrestling. Enjoy the G1. Um, We'll have a little later edition of the podcast next week because uh, I have to cover the finals of G1, and that's going to take a while for me to do, so <laughs> just bear with me. But we'll have a new episode for episode 323 next week. And um, on that note, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Uh, you can also hit me up on Twitter and Instagram if you like at Josh Lopez Media. And um, hope you guys enjoy this podcast. It was a lot of fun. Now sit back, relax. And strap it out and enjoy another brand new edition of the Thoughts of Derrico. I'll talk to y'all next week. I love you guys. This has been episode 322 of Hoops Podcast. We'll talk to y'all later. Uh, yes, sir. And now, the Thoughts of Derrico. Listen well, man. Welcome, welcome, one and all to the segment that's been more excited about wrestling than it has in a long time. It is The Thoughts of Derrico, featuring the one, the only, Brother Carter. So sorry to not be with you live this week. I'm getting back to my normal routine, so unfortunately I'm going to need to be via satellite for the foreseeable future. But if myself and Brother Adam can work out some times where we might be able to record different times, I don't know, we'll see if I can make my way back live and in living color. We will have to see. But for right now, unfortunately, i got to be via satellite. But that's not going to stop me from talking about this week in professional wrestling. And what a week it's been. All right, let's start with SmackDown. The uh, first Triple H run SmackDown in the new era. And man, did this show deliver. This was great. Start off with the bloodline walking in. Of course, Jimmy and Jay are driving. Uh, you would think they would get their own car because they're a part of the bloodline. But... Roman Reigns, of course, gets his own private transportation. I was thinking more along the lines of, like, NWO Elite when they would get their own transports and the regular NWO would have to drive. I was getting kind of flashbacks of that. But anyways, that was cool. Pat McAfee doing a replay of his match like a football analyst. I love it. Like, he was drawing things and all that stuff, you know, like drawing stuff on the on the prompter and all that stuff. I thought that was great. Uh, there were sound effects and stuff. I thought that was hilarious. That was great. You know, it looks like the feud with him and Happy Corbin isn't over yet. And that's totally, totally fine. Hey, it's Ricochet, the first person to wrestle on a Triple H era show. And that's an excellent choice, if I do say so myself. Great stuff from Ricochet. I was hoping that tonight would... Or I say tonight. I, I wrote some notes down. I was hoping that this we're finally going to get the end of the Happy Corbin gimmick. Now we've got a new era coming in. I've said this for a while. I think it's time for Baron Corbin. Who, who Baron Corbin isn't MVP. He takes anything that's given to him and makes it awesome. So props to Baron Corbin for his work. But I think it's time. It's time to get rid of the happy Corbin gimmick. He needs to go back to just being Baron Corbin and kicking ass in everything that he does. It would seem that Corbin McAfee isn't done yet, and I'm okay with that. Ricochet sells so well, and he makes his opponents look so good. The shooting star press he does is beautiful. Great, great stuff. Good match with Nakamura and Ludwig Kaiser. I think that Nakamura versus Gunther this coming week on SmackDown is going to be awesome. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> Sami Zayn sucking up to the Osos and then going to the production truck was great. I thought that was hilarious. Um, good stuff. I'm not sure what they're going to do with Sami Zayn going forward. I thought he was going to be involved in the main event segment, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. 
boy, the crowd turned on Liv Morgan real fast. I was kind of surprised about that. Like, they seemed all, you know, excited for her, winning her championship and stuff, but they were starting to boo her pretty quickly. So I don't know what's the deal with Liv Morgan. Maybe the, the new Liv smell is wearing off. We'll have to see. But I thought I was kind of surprised by that. Gauntlet man. Then they had the gauntlet match, which was cool. But the gauntlet match was very telling about who WWE is planning to push in the future. Now I like the idea of a gauntlet match, but the only problem with this one was it was in the second hour of the show, so it's a bit predictable. And you know the superstars, I didn't really feel like were given enough time to really showcase what they can do. But they pushed the hell out of Raquel Rodriguez, gave her four victories. But finally, 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 Shayna Baszler is getting a title match, and it's about damn time i don't know what vince has not been seeing in Shayna baszler as a main event player she's a superstar she's a stud she's fan freaking tastic and it's about damn time we put some respect on Shayna's name this is such an easy story to tell you've got two ufc fighters the four horsewomen you know if they want to have ronda turn on on Shayna, if they want to have ronda help Shayna. either way you can do a program if they if they want to do a program with Ronda and Shayna, they can easily do that. So that way you can keep the title on Liv Morgan if that's what they want to do. They can easily have Shayna Baszler win the title, and then they can do a program with Ronda Rousey. It's going to be fantastic. It's an easy story to write, but thank God Shayna Baszler is finally getting her time to shine. Viking Raiders beat up some jobbers. I was wish I was hoping that they would uh, fight Trip Bradshaw. And it looks like we're going to have some new women's tag team champions crowned. Very interesting. We're going to get into that when we get into Raw here in a little bit. And then we get into the final segment. Of course, Roman Reigns comes out, does a great promo. Drew McIntyre comes out, and he's ready to go. And who makes their return? Oh, my God. Karrion Cross and Scarlett are back. I marked the frick out on my couch when this happened. This was unbelievable. As soon as I heard that music, I was like, wait, I kind of recognize that. And then they, they cut and showed Scarlet standing in the entranceway with the black and white screen. I just lost my mind on the couch. It was unbelievable. I was like, holy shit, it's Karrion Cross. And he comes out and attacks Roman Reigns. Unbelievable. I think Karrion Cross's theme stuck in my head all week, literally. This is amazing. I don't understand what Vince didn't see in him in NXT. He never got a fair shot because he debuted right at the beginning of COVID. This is awesome. Vince royally screwed this one up. Triple H righted a wrong. Bring him back, Karrion Cross and Scarlett. That's freaking awesome. Great way to have SmackDown. Great momentum going. And I hate to say this, but it, it, it was time for Vince to go. And this right here is the main reason. Unbelievable. So happy to see Scarlett and, and Karrion Cross back. I now have no idea what's going to happen at Clash in the Castle. But that's what you want. You want a reason to tune in. And let's talk about Raw, because we got some stuff here that gave us some reasons to tune in. We had a decent opening promo segment with Bailey and um, Dakota Kai and Io Sky. Nothing really special, but it was fine. Looking forward to the six-woman tag between them and then um, Bianca Belair and Asuka and Alexa Bliss at Clash of the Castle. I think that'll be fun. And then we get a post-match brawl that actually makes sense. What a concept. Oh, my God. Angelo Dawkins was repping a LeBron look in Cleveland, and I was asking, are we sure he's a face? Hmm. I don't know if uh, uh, LeBron is well-liked in the in Josh's favorite city in the world, in Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, if the stomp doesn't work, go to a tried-and-true move. Good win for Rollins, and I, you know, using the pedigree. I could see that this leading some tension between the Street Profits, with Montez Ford getting tossed away and both of them losing in singles matches to Seth Rollins. I can see there being some tension. They've teased a, a split of the Street Profits, and I'd be okay with that. I think both of them uh, deserve an opportunity at a singles run. Uh, Montez Ford has been incredible, but De uh, Angelo Dawkins has really come a long way in the last few months. So we'll have to see. Some good stuff. Dominic apparently lis is uh, listening to the dark side of the force. Also, I said this on Twitter, too, and a lot of people commented on this and saying, you know, Rhea Ripley beat up Dominic, and I'm like, hey, what the two of them do on their time is their business. That's if if they it's, if that's what they're into, go for it. But I'm digging Rhea Ripley beating up Dominic. I'm I, you got to assume it's going to lead to him joining Judgment Day, but we'll see. Dedicating something to Harley Race was very cool. Perhaps the greatest United States champion of all time. Uh, that would have never happened in the Vince McMahon era. So this is truly a new era, and it's awesome. 
pun intended. Great stuff from Champa. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, but yeah, so that's very cool. KO looks like we got the old version of KO. He comes back, just beats the hell out of Ezekiel. Um, the match just kind of goes to a no contest, so it looks like we'll be seeing um, more of this aggressive side of KO, the NXT side of KO, and I'm all about it. Did you notice there was a car accident in the back during the KO segment? WWE didn't acknowledge that. Very interesting. And then you get the Judgment Day segment. They're already planning for Raw two weeks out in a hometown match that makes sense. What a concept! I feel like that's the kind of the theme for the week. Josh, you may have to think about naming the show this. What a concept. That you're actually booking things that make sense that WWE is doing and other promotions, <coughs> AEW, is not doing. So what a concept. But that's cool. Damian Priest is going to face Edge in his hometown two weeks from now. Not next week, but two weeks from now. They're already planning the match. That's really cool. Again, Dominic beat the, or Rhea Ripley beat the hell out of Dominic Stereo. Now, I do want to, I was going to ask Josh this question, but uh, I'm not quite sure about the idea of Zoe Stark and Nikita Lyons. I mean, it's cool. I, I don't get to see him much in NXT. I would think maybe they should have gone with Toxic Attraction to be in the NXT Tag Team title tournament, or in the Women's Tag Team title tournament. That's what I would have liked to see. Not disappointed about seeing Nikita Lyons or Zoe Stark. Absolutely, don't get me wrong. But I was thinking they would have gone with Toxic Attraction because you could have brought up Mandy Rose, too, and had some interaction with Sonya Deville. So, I don't know, just my thought. But we'll see. Um, good match overall um, with uh, Dakota and Io and um, Dana Brooke and Tamina. That's what I want to see more of from Dana Brooke and Tamina. I know they can wrestle. I know they can go. And they had a chance to show what they could do in a two-segment match. More of that. Dump the 24-7 championship. It's That thing has run its course. It's time to get rid of it. Do something funny. If they want to do something else with our truth and Tazawa, fine. But you've got to get rid of this 24-7 championship. It's It's just time. It's just time. Um, great match with, uh, Champa and Lashley. Really enjoyed that. Um, really, really good stuff there. Um, Dolph Ziggler got a chance to win in his hometown. Thought that was really cool. Uh, and then of course, um, the no DQ match. And I, I can't remember if I'm missing something, but the no DQ match with Dolph, uh, with AJ Styles. And, um, if I missed something, I apologize, but the no, the no DQ match, AJ Styles and, um, the Miz, uh, great stuff from both of them. But, of course, the big thing to close out the show, the return of Dexter Loomis. A couple times throughout the night, he was there was a car accident, the paramedics running through trying to chase down this guy, and all of a sudden we get a 30-second glimpse of Dexter Loomis, not barely acknowledged by the commentators, but then he's arrested. Most of the crowd know who he is. They're like, didn't Dexter Loomis? I could, the, the camera, like the main WWE shot, didn't quite zoom in so we couldn't quite see exactly what was going on but then the commentators mentioned it i did some tweeting about it and sure enough it was dexter loomis wwe acknowledged it on their youtube videos that, we, uh, that they post out saying it was dexter loomis i love this so cool incredible storytelling where they just plant a seed and then they kind of you know build on it throughout the night so carrying cross is back dakota kai is back eo sky is back Dexter Loomis now. I'm hoping it leads to Indy Hartwell because that would be fantastic. So WWE has now given us a reason, subtle storytelling, and a reason to tune in every week. Vince McMahon completely dropped the ball on this. I'm glad he's gone. I mean, don't get me wrong. We love Vince McMahon. Time for Vince to go. New era of Triple H. I haven't been this excited for a long time. Now, obviously, we want to see where this goes because it's, you know, it's just new and these things take time to develop. But very, very exciting for Triple H to be in charge. Very, very exciting for WWE. It's an incredible time to be a wrestling fan. Those are the thoughts of Derrico this week. My final thought is just continuing on that. It's an incredible time to be a wrestling fan right now. Let's just sit back and enjoy it and see what amazing things we're going to be seeing over the next few weeks. This has been The Thoughts of Derrico. You're smarter now, man.